everybody. Um, my name is Kay Fi Steele. I work for the National Writing Project, and this is the first in our series of, um, I guess I called it the Copper Tape Club, but I really see it as more of a tinkering club and as a way for libraries, museums, communi community centers, like really informal and formal education spaces to start to dip their toe into some professional development. And I am really excited about this because I feel like, uh, you know, I've gone to a lot of conferences or professional development workshops or even like in, in Philly where I used to work at the library, there were uh, these all staff days and I would see all of these great projects and I'm so used to being in the role of facilitator that I would play with it a little bit but then step back and really it was always my role to facilitate other people's making and so I think it's really important for us to be making ourselves and for us to be playing around with things and for us to be able to have resources where we can really start from like okay can you just tell me what a circuit is or I don't know how to light an LED with a coin cell battery so this series is really about introducing people from the very beginning to things like, you know, these topics can be anything that we want them to be. And uh, I'm starting it off with copper tape circuits, but I'm hoping that it'll move towards other tools that people have and really use a lot within their sites, things like possibly 3D printers or um, like, like audio editing software or video production software, or even using a green screen, things like that. So the things that you love, the things that you like to use, the things that you want to learn, uh, we're going to go through all that stuff. So before I go any further, I thought that maybe we should go around and introduce ourselves because some of us know each other, but since this is going to be, this is a hangout on air, many people don't know who you are. So I said who I am. Corey, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, my name is Corey Wittig. I am the digital learning librarian at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, and my role is to be the program manager of our teen learning lab, the labs. All right, Sid, do you want to go next? Hi, I'm Sydney. I work at the Dream Yard Art Center. I am a program coordinator, so I help coordinate a lot of the programs in our space. I am an educator and I'm also kind of a default mentor. That's what I do. Cool. Hannah? Hi, I'm Hannah. Um, I work at the Kensington Library, which is part of the Free Library of Philadelphia, and um, I run the makerspace there. Cool. Teresha? Hi, I'm Teresha. I am a program specialist at the National Writing Project. I support online communications, and I'm a maker in training. <laughs> That's fine. All right, and Toby? Hi, I'm uh, Toby Greenwalt. I'm Director of Digital Strategy at Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, and a lot of my work has been uh, at a remove from a lot of the direct hands-on maker stuff, but I'm eager to jump in and get my hands dirty as much as I can. Great. Is there anyone who has not made a circuit before, has not done anything like that before? You all have done it? Okay, perfect. But um, even if you haven't, I thought that maybe we should use this opportunity to go through some basic supplies that you would need for this. Um, does everybody have their coin cell battery? <laughs> cool. Okay. So um, generally the way that I start these workshops is I have, I have someone just take their coin cell battery and then I have them take an LED. Um, so I keep a bunch of LEDs in a bag. And then I have them take a good look at the LED and tell me what they notice about the LED. So it's a lot of letting them explore and tell me what they see and what they notice. So, I mean, if you look at it closely, you can see that one leg is longer than the other leg. And then other people will say, you know, oh, there's a light bulb, there's some things in the inside. And then I'll have them take a pretty close look at the battery. And if you look at the battery, I'll tell them, you know, what do you see? I'll ask them, what do they see? And they'll be like, well, it's a bunch of, I don't know, like uh, it's a bunch of letters, maybe some, um, I can't tell what language that is, maybe Japanese, maybe Chinese, and it has a plus sign, but the plus sign is the most important thing. And I ask them, you know, what does that mean? And it's positive, right? 
And so then I issue them a challenge. Um, you know, how can you figure out how to light this up? Uh, has anyone else done any projects like this where they are introducing people to? Do you want to talk about how you do it? I feel like for us it comes up most commonly with Mickey Mickey. So we'll use our uh, Mickey Mickey Nintendo controller that I showed at a previous Hangout. And, you know, it's set up so you have to wear a wristband to ground yourself. So you kind of explain how a circuit is made and completed through, you know, them actually playing the game, showing that if you touch the controls without being grounded, it doesn't work. Although occasionally it does work. <laughs> and then we're like, uh, well, no, it's um, something our head of IT said. Uh, it was something to do with, like, in something or other, which is very complicated. But generally, that explanation works, and, and, and we show that. But yeah, I mean, we've also sort of done just hold the LED to the battery and talk about it that way. Um, so when you're talking, what, if you're using the Makey Makey or an LED in a coin cell battery, uh, be, like how do you describe what's happening? Hmm. And anyone can answer this, not okay. just Corey. I'm going to pass. <laughs> Well, when you're touching, um, so when you're using the Makey Makey, what I've always said is, um, you know, it's making basically a circle. It's making a loop between the battery and the LED. And um, I feel like the best way to describe it is to actually have them do it. And my favorite thing, and this is so cruel, but watching people try to light an LED, because, you know, everyone does the same thing. You know, they like... I don't know if it can hopefully will focus on this. They'll, like, stick it on top. They'll kind of, like like futz around with it like back and forth and then they'll put it on the wrong way and they get really frustrated really fast. Adults more so than kids. Is this something that you guys have noticed? Yeah, I, um, so, you know, positive to positive, negative to negative is generally what I say after they've struggled for a bit or, I, you know, I just try to like push them to be able to figure it out. But basically what's happening here and, you know, I'm, I'm not an electrical engineer, I, uh, but from my understanding, um, well, so the word circuit comes from the Latin word circle. So that's one way to think about it. But basically you're creating a circle from the positive side of the battery through the LED and then back through the negative side. Um, I feel like it's a little harder to understand like this, but it's really easy to understand when you're using something else like the Makey Makey or copper tape because it's actually more of a line that connects all of those things. But, um, yeah, so what's happening right here is that there are, if you want to know the science behind it, which is not, not very fun because I feel like we should be making stuff right now, but the electrons in the battery are going through the leads in the these legs and then through the LED and then back down and back into the battery. And something that I've always heard people say is that electrons are lazy. They don't want to have to work, but if you... Um, if you hold it like against a battery like this, the electrons have nowhere else to go, so they have to go through the through the LED to get back down to the battery. They always just want to be back in the battery, and that's where um, that's called current is the flow of electrons from one to the other. So that's the science behind it. But I thought that maybe now that you understand that, um, we could take those things, we could take our binder clip and a piece of paper and some copper tape. I'm guessing you guys have all of these materials. And we can all just make a simple circuit. And as we're making that circuit, we can just talk about our experience leading copper tape circuits for the first time with youth or with adults. Um, and I was thinking maybe Hannah or Sid, you might be willing to share some of that experience as we make a simple circuit. Sure. I think one thing that I I was saying to K5 before everybody jumped on that I actually had to get an example from last spring. It's called Sweet Sweet Spring. It's a little book that kids made, but we haven't really done much with copper circuits since last spring just because they do um, they got old and kids were really frustrated with the copper tape and we actually got um, copper tape from somewhere else, I guess, the second time we ordered it, or the third time we ordered it, and it was crappy copper tape, and it made a huge difference. I mean, 
you had to mess with the copper tape to try and stick it down, and it was too thin, and charge didn't, I mean, the current didn't stay in it if there was a little bit of a bump or anything. And so that was enough to get kids sort of like, they went back to just doing this and taping it on things, you know, doing the, tape the battery, the LED light to the battery rather than really work through the copper tape. Um, oh, so they were basically just making throwies and then sticking those to things. Yes, yeah. <laughs> which is something you can do. I mean, it, and if you don't, if the copper tape isn't working, then it's like, why not? Why not do it the way it work, that it works well? So I'd like to get them back into copper tape and have good ways that it works better. Um, and some of that is just getting better copper tape, but also switches that work well enough where there's an incentive to do copper tape. Because then yeah. the cool thing about copper tape is you can make a little switch that turns things on and off. Yeah, let's talk about switches because I think that those are a really fun way to do like a second level of uh, copper tape circuits. But um, going back to what you were saying about having really crappy copper tape, do you know where you were getting your copper tape from? I don't, I don't know what, what the second one was. Or which order it was that, but, and it is something we have to figure out. But you can feel it um, when you get it if it's how thick it is. Yeah, ours is pretty bad. We've had trouble with it; just rips so easily. And you know, right. we were using it on those brace the bracelet for the Makey Makey to ground, and yeah, it was just frustrating. It works really well with paper, but if you try right. to use it with any other material, it's going to flex and move a lot. It can right, be troublesome. And I think also the the nicer stuff is like a piece of metal, and it does cut kids. And I remember being like, "Oh, this stuff, like it's great. Nobody's getting cut anymore." Then also, none of the things were working. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. So you're naming a lot of things right now that I feel like we should also be talking about. Yeah, copper tape. Um, so as you're laying it down you're going to want to, obviously, it's just like a sticker. You're going to want to press it down on the paper. But as you're doing that, the edges, it is possible to cut yourself. And I think when we were doing some project that was using a lot of copper tape, I had like very thin cuts all over my fingers. And you don't really feel them as they're happening. But then you would just notice like, oh, I'm bleeding or that kid is bleeding. So just be careful. Mm -hmm. um, maybe use, I've seen people use like, like uh, erasers to press um, the copper tape down, or I don't know, like the end of a marker to do it too. Um, is the you guys, binder clip for a, is that for the switch, Kfi? So the binder clip, I'll just show you what I made, and I'm cheating a little bit because I made this maybe in the first five, in like the five minutes before I got into this hangout. Um, okay, so the way that I, so this is my very simple circuit. And the way that I always begin is just with a pencil and with a piece of paper. So um, I find where I want my corner to be, and that's where I'm going to basically be holding my battery. So Corey, what you were saying, like, is the binder clip for the switch? I use the binder clip to hold the battery in place. Mm -hmm. So the way that the way that I plan it out is. I fold the battery into this piece of paper and then I press it down pretty hard. I'm just going to click myself so it stays on me for a minute. Um, and you can see the outline of the battery right there, right? So then what I'll do is I'll like pick this up and I'll just trace where the battery is. And then if you can see the outline on the other side, then I'll trace that. And since my battery is facing up, um, I want to put the positive side on there because that's where the positive side is going to touch. And then on the other side, just to remind myself, I'll put a negative side or a negative sign. And then I figure out where I want to put my actual LED. So I'm just going to stick it right in the middle right now. So usually I'll just mark it with an X or just something where I know, like, okay, that's where my battery is going to go. And then basically you want to make a line that connects to the X but leave a gap because that's where the LED is going to go, and if you don't um, leave a gap in your copper tape right there, you are going to enable your lazy electrons, and they're just going to take the copper tape route and not jump through the LED to light it up and then go back to the battery. So then I draw a line back to the negative side. 
And then what you can do is start laying down your copper tape. And um, one thing I learned, oh, so much of this is inspired, by the way, by Ji Chi, who's amazing. She's at the MIT Media Lab, and she's done a ton of stuff with copper tape circuits. Um, she always said to never rip your copper tape, but to fold it. And does everyone know? Can someone <laughs> describe what that is? Do you guys have, have you, has anyone figured out special ways to fold copper tape? Because there are a few ways to do it. This is, and everything that I'm saying, like, this is the way that, this is just the way that I've learned how to do it. But if you think of other ways, or if you're with kids that have figured out other ways to do it, you know, it's not, it's like drawing. There's not just one way to do it. Well, I can describe how I fold copper tape. Right? I learned from you, so. Okay, okay, all right. And I learned from Key. Okay, so here's my first line that I just put down. Um, you're going to find that it's really hard to bend the copper tape like that because half of the, so the one side of the copper tape is just copper, but the other side has this adhesive that's sticky, but it's also conductive. So just know that if you were to go to the hardware store and buy copper tape there, it might not necessarily have the adhesive backing. So I tend to buy my copper tape through um, SparkFun or Adafruit. They're really cheap. It's like $3 for a roll that's about this big. Um, and I've never used up a roll entirely. I haven't done that yet. But uh, the way that you fold this is you want to take the tape and basically, so this is my tape that's going in one direction. You want to pull it in the opposite direction that you want it to go in. So basically, let me see. Basically, you want to have it so now the sticky side is facing you. And this is, it's really easy. Then you just kind of pinch it down like that so it's flat. And then that allows you to fold it back down this way. So what you end up with, let me see, you end up with this kind of like corner. Mm, I'm waiting for my camera to focus. Does that, can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. So just know that the way I always think about it, because sometimes I'll find myself kind of confused, you want to fold it first in the opposite direction from the way that you want to go, make a crease, and then fold it back so that it's going in the right direction. So I'll do that one more time. So now I want to make a turn, a 90 degree turn that's going this way. So what I do is I fold it in the opposite direction that I want to go in. And then I bring it back in the way that I want it to go in. So now it's like that. And that's where I can either tear it or cut it. Um, copper tape is really terrible. so. And it's not the prettiest, but <laughs> there you go. Um, so now the next step is getting your LED on. And what I had mentioned before is your LED one has one leg that's longer than the other. And so the longer leg is the positive side, and the shorter leg is the negative side. It's hard to remember that sometimes, but um, if I ever forget, I just grab a coin cell battery and I'll stick it on both sides and be like, okay, good reminder, the longer leg is the positive side. But it can be kind of confusing when you go to stick it down on a piece of paper because sometimes you'll forget which way is the positive side so, or which end is the positive end because when you fold out the legs, they both kind of look like kind of the same length. So what I'll usually do is um, just fold down one leg at a time. So I just folded down the positive leg, since that's the first one I'm going to be taping down. And um, underneath my tape is where I'll stick it. Uh, there's sometimes, a, Barbara used to do this at the Free Library of Philadelphia, this woman that we worked with. She would put it on top of the copper tape and then put another piece of copper tape on top of that. I haven't found that that's always necessary, but sometimes that's helpful to have a really strong connection. So let's just do that now for the sake of this. I didn't really know how this hangout was going to go. It's like, hopefully it's just not me like doing a demo. And it's like, oh, it's me doing a demo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for 
the <laughs> negative side, I'm going to take it off me. Um, okay, so for the negative side, you just do the exact same thing that you did before. You can either put a piece of tape down and then tape over it, but for this, I'm just going to put a piece of tape on top of it and then make that 90 degree turn. Are you guys making as you're going along too? I had to start over though because I was tearing and it didn't keep the current. <laughs> yeah, um, tearing, I mean, it'll still work. If you want really strong connections, you can also solder to the copper tape. Yeah. Um, but I feel like if you're just doing an introductory workshop with um, like copper tape circuits, you don't want to bring too many tools into the mix at first, though I think that everyone loves learning how to solder, so that could be certainly a way to build on top. So and that's something that I'd like to talk about. Go ahead. Okay, if I, if, um, you said something about leaving a gap where the LED was going to go. Do you, yeah. cut, cut, do you cut the tape? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's where I would tear the tape and just make sure you leave a gap. The gap is really important. So if you don't leave a gap there and you just have one continuous um, one continuous line of copper tape or wire or whatever you're using, and then you try to put an LED on top of that, the LED is not going to light up, and that's what's called a short circuit. So it means that the electrons from the battery have been able to just bypass the LED. Okay, so here's my circuit. Has any has anyone else made theirs? <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna show you mine because mine isn't really working that well, and this is a really good opportunity to show you how I have troubleshooted this in the past. So as you can see, the battery is in here, and um, it's all connected, but now it's not lighting up. And so what I do when that's not happening is I start to press down on the different pieces of tape. And now you can see it's starting to light up. And it's usually because it's not um, like, like the copper tape isn't pressed down hard enough or it's like not adhering to the paper or it's probably because it's not connecting to the actual LED. So when it's not lighting, that's the first thing I do is I just have people kind of like poke around the circuit and just see. So now it's lit, and that's how you make a really simple circuit. Does anyone want to share theirs? <laughs> Not lighting yet. <laughs> I think I lost it on the fold, perhaps. I lost my battery. <laughs> Oh, that leads me to another thing, and I feel like I've seen this at a, at a few sites. Um, you don't want to keep, so you're going to end up with a lot of these loose batteries around, and you, the, my instinct is to always just grab them and like throw them all into one container or throw them all into one bag, and you, you don't want to do that. You always want to have your batteries separate because sometimes when coin cell batteries will touch other coin cell batteries, they'll short each other out. And so you'll just end up with a giant bag of dead batteries. And then you've just wasted, I don't know, twelve or fifteen dollars. But think about what those batteries could have done. You don't wanna you don't wanna give them that kind of life. So, <laughs> so just be kind to your coin cells. And then, you know, you if you're running youth programs or if you're just doing this with kids, you're gonna run through a lot of coin cell batteries. So I always try to save my coin cell batteries and then drop them off at a at a recycling place or um, you know, one of those bins that one comes across every so often. So Toby, I can hear you through Corey's oh, microphone. Yeah, I was, I was covering the Corey across the table, but I thought about doing something clever at first, but I realized for my first foray into this, I better just keep it simple. And what are you? What are your challenges that you're finding right now? Um, well, just thinking through where one lead ends up to the battery, 
and then relating that to the physical path that the uh, the the tape takes. And oh, sounds like it sounds like it's a really cerebral activity. Can you show me? Yeah. So <laughs> I I kind of I started out trying to make a shape, and I ended up just going back and doing kind of the same path that you had created. So. Um, yeah, I took this here. I'm going to fold this back. Let's see here. And so I do have a light. I can't tell how well I'm showing up, but I was able to complete a circuit. Now I'm just going to close that off, get the binder clip on. Okay, so there. I've got, I don't know if you can see that, but. I think you have to hold it up a little bit. I can assure you it's lit up. <laughs> All right. So. From here, it's it's probably now it's going to be a matter of figuring out how I want to improvise and create new shapes with it. Uh, well, your corners are beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and um, does anyone else has anyone else made one? I got it. Am I the exact same process really? I tried to do a star, and then I was tearing it, and I think it was losing the current through. Um, here's my star that I had to abandon. <laughs> so yeah, and the first LED actually wasn't lighting up, but I think it was a dud LED. So I just laid another one over it, and that. So yeah. So um, Sid, were you making one over there? You've been very quiet. I didn't make one because we do these kind of all the time. <laughs> but um, we. What's been helpful for us, for the kids, is having these templates. I don't know if people can see this, but it's kind of like a path of how, you know, you can put your battery, you can put your LED, and it's a good starter tool to get them to do this first before they have to actually do it on their own. We have them start that with, like, the layout, and then we say, like, now that you get the idea, you should do it on your own. Try different patterns. Figure out where you want your LED. So it's a, it's kind of like a baby step in between, I think. Yeah, I think that's great. I'm wondering if that's something that maybe, do you have a digital file of that? I can find one, yeah. Yeah, or yeah. If, even if you take a picture of it with your phone and then send it to me, I think that's a great sure. resource to be able to put on the Community of Practice site. You know, I, I always think of those as like just a hand holding you as, you know, just, you know, so you right. don't have to get too creative, you don't have to get too wild, you know exactly where your battery is going to go, and it's all kind of laid out for you. We have four different versions of it. One is just the basic circuit, one's with the switch, one's like a parallel circuit. We can put double lights, and another one is a um, like a slide circuit. We can kind of slide paper in between for tape, so it'll like turn off and on. But those are like four basic. Try this first. Once you get that, then we can do stuff on your own. Cool. So let's. We should maybe talk about switches or how to add other LEDs on top of this. Um, I have one quick question. Sure. Okay. What? Do you use those sticker LEDs more often than the leggy LEDs? No, no, we, we use the, the regular ones. We know what the stickers ones look like, but they're a little bit more expensive, and they're, like, yeah. kind of hard to work with in a lot of ways, so we're like, forget it. We'll just use this template and put regular LEDs on it. And it kind of okay. works out. Gotcha. Thank you. <laughs> talk about the sticker LEDs? Um, well, I just noticed on a template that you had that little triangle sticker LED, which is, I think they're always in a triangle, like hers. Um, and the LED is in the middle, one side is positive, one side is negative. But I had similar, like they are more expensive and they don't stick for very long. And their, their light doesn't even always look bright. Mm -hmm. So I actually have some of them right here, and these were made by Gigi. Um, they're really little, as you can see. They're about like this big, and they come in different colors. And um, so uh, she also, so I bought them last year at Maker Fair, and they came with this book that also has a bunch of templates. It's like a, a little mini activity book, but. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's great, and I think as a facilitator, you should certainly get one and check it out. And I can put a link to this as well. But at the same, but okay, 
it's it's great. A lot of these things already exist on the internet, so you might not necessarily have to pay for it, but it's nice because it's basically this activity book that walks you through, like what Sid was saying, like different kinds of circuits, different kinds of switches, how to add multiple lights, like that kind of thing. But it is expensive. I think I bought this, even at Maker Faire, this was about $25. And when you think about having to scale this across, mm -hmm. let's say, you know, 25 kids, that's a lot of money that you're spending versus, you know, a bag of LEDs, which is, you know, $6 and a bunch of coin cell batteries and doing it much more on the cheap and much more, you know, I guess DIY style. The other thing that's really nice about these, though, is that, I mean, look at this piece of tape. They're so flat. So you could put these inside a notebook or inside a sketchbook or even on anything that you wanted to stay flat and be able to, um, yeah, not have to worry about, like, this, <laughs> that kind of profile. Um, Hannah, can you talk about some of the circuits you've done with kids with, like, hole punching? Sure. One of the, uh, the book that I'm holding, well, I just touched on but this is a little um, one-page book. I don't know. Can people see it at all? It's too bright. <laughs> anyway, it's a one-page book. And when you unfold it, it's one sheet of paper. And I put a card piece of cardboard on one of the squares, and that's where the circuit is. I don't know if this is like visible at all, but anyway. Um, but we, because we are using the large LEDs, once this is folded, we put uh, a hole with a hole punch, and that makes the light go through the whole book. Is that visible at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can definitely see it. All right. So that's, um, we've done that with books, the whole punch, the light coming through, like a whole book. And it's kind of like, you know, like those uh, children's books that have a hole that go through the whole story and different things happen with the hole. There's a really famous one called The Hole, and it's a really good book. But <laughs> this was like a fun it's, that's a fun book to go along with this, and then you can keep the, the, what the light actually is changes through the story. And then um, we also do ones that are just one piece of cardboard. The light goes through the whole punch, and the circuit's on the back, so then you're drawing lights up in some way. And that way, the temptation to make the copper tape into the part of the design isn't there, which can be cool, but it can also make the copper tape circuit not necessarily work as well. Um, cool. Thanks. Yeah, I love these. Um, I love the one-page zine model because, you know, it's like, like Sid's templates. You know, it's a template. It exists. And it's one piece of paper, which is amazing. Like, you can tell this whole story and this whole narrative with just one piece of paper. And you could investigate. It goes, you know, it's like the art comes first and then the electronics come second. And those are always my favorite projects that are have anything to do with, I guess, like maker projects is where you can really put the literacy and the storytelling first as a way to teach um, like basic circuits and like kind of engineering-y things. So I have on my, I've, I've made so many of these lists that are like, okay, I'm just going to sit here and think of every possible thing that has a light in it, like anything in nature that you see, anything in your neighborhood, anything in a city, and just make a huge list and like, okay, well, what are, what on this list are my favorite things? Like, what would I want to draw or what would I want to turn into a card for my mom? Or, you know, to try to get kids to think about that and to think creatively as opposed to pushing them to do engineering too hard, especially for like reluctant learners or kids where, um, yeah, the circuits might be a little more challenging to get them to think about the art first if they're more inclined to think about art versus actually like assembling the circuit. But then you will have kids that are just really into engineering and coming up with different ways to craft circuits. Um, do any of you guys have examples of switches that you might want to show or talk about how to make the switches? 
We I don't have this on me. I think it got um, cannibalized for another project, perhaps. But we've used the the snaps. They're conductive metal snaps, so you can make like a, a cuff or something like that. You know, so you're you would you would create your circuit using conductive thread in this example, um, and have say the the switch ends up being kind of disruption in the in the path of the circuit. So I think it was that you know the the positive side just kind of ends being tied off on on one end of the snap. It continues from the other snap. Um, so the circuit is only completed when the snap when the cuff actually snaps together. So basically, if you just imagine the the, the circuits that we've just created, um, and creating something that just kind of opens and closes part of that part of that path. Um, so in this case, it's that snap, but it could just be, you know, if you did that book example, maybe there's something that you interact with that's sort of a little pop-up piece that you press down, or or something along those lines. But that's nice for the wearable stuff because if you don't have a battery pack that has a on-off switch, which is going to cost you more money, the switch, you know, actually keeps it from draining the battery. So when this the cup is unsnapped, you can keep your battery in, and it's not draining battery power. Um, but when it's on and you want the light to be turned on, then you know it works. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I imagine that that could be done really easily. I was just thinking about um, figuring out how to do that with like even a piece of paper. So say you have your battery over here somewhere and the LED is over here. It seems like you could go like run your positive side that way, run your negative side that way. And then when you turn, pull it together, you could, I mean, this is like the really DIY version. You could take a paper clip and then connect those two sides and then, or you take a, like a binder clip and then this would light up because that would be literally completing the circuit. Yeah, if you had two, a paper clip on each side and just hooked it through the other end, it would do the same thing. That's even more interesting because that's actually like more of like a jewelry clasp. That's really cool. I like that idea a lot. Um, so what I like about this is that yeah, it introduces kids to like um, engineering concepts in a way. And I remember when I was figuring out. So when I I wasn't using G's templates like the ones that Sid was talking about. Like we kind of challenge kids to think about different ways to do switches or to do like, okay, you've got like one LED lit up. How can you do two? Or how could you do three? Or how could you make it so there's something like a switch so that when I press over here, it turns on or turns off. And I feel like it was using this really different part of my brain than the creative side because you're really trying to problem solve and you're drawing it out at the same time. So I always recommend having like a lot of paper and like pencils and markers to draw out ideas for switches on before you actually start laying down the copper tape because once you start laying it down and it doesn't work you'll get frustrated but if you have a roadmap for yourself much like those um, those uh, examples I feel like that's really helpful. One fun thing along those lines of figuring out ways to do switches was um, when I was doing with kids was figuring out other things that are metal, you know, like paper clips metal and what other things lying around like putting a penny, leaving a gap and just putting, sliding a penny in as the closing of the circuit. And then we did a project that I had a lot of keys from multiple old apartments that I for some reason never throw away. But then we started using the key as the, the switch, which is kind of like a cool concept. We had a, a, a couple um, LED circuits on a spaceship, and the key was a what was used on. You could light up different lights by putting the key in between, so it was kind of like turning on the spaceship. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that idea a lot. Yeah, the one thing about it was that it doesn't. You need to keep hold the key pretty hard, hard against the. You know, you need the pressure. So I like the, the snap because that's like keeps the pressure without your hand being on it. If so you other ways of like. Through the hole in the key, I wonder if that would work better. Maybe. Huh. Yeah, and then maybe just having a place you could, like, covered in copper tape that you could a hole covered in copper tape you could slide the key. You know, so when you let go, it still lights up. 
So AJ Almaguer from Lawrence Hall, we were talking about copper tape and he was like, yeah, I like copper tape. And he was like, you know, what's almost better than copper tape is um, tin foil. Because tin foil is almost like for some, like, I, I haven't experimented that much with tin foil, but he, it's his claim that it's almost more conductive than copper tape. Huh. So I can even imagine something like you have something where the key would go into that the whole inside would just be tin foil. And what's right. great about tinfoil is that you have it in your house. Most people have it in their house, and it's so cheap. And I I love experimenting and, and going along with what you were saying. Like, you know, I had all these keys from old apartments. Um, you don't always have to be buying new materials, and that's one thing that I, I love about this stuff is, and I think it, like, really speaks to my inherent cheapness <laughs> and my inherent hoarder. Um, you know, I have all of these things that I just keep around all the time and it's really empowering to be like just have a bunch of stuff at your disposal and be able to grab different things and be like oh well I have all of these pennies pennies conduct electricity let's try using them like your example Hannah um, I think that's a really cool idea and you should encourage that because you know why spend money on things when you could be spending money on like things why spend money on like you know deliberate things that might cost a dollar each when you can just use the things that are around you and I've noticed, um, well, first of all, I think librarians are always going to perk up at the idea that they could use found stuff and the crafty things and materials that they're used to using for traditional library programs. Um, and I sort of lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's the one thing. Oh, I just think it kind of demystifies it a little bit. You know, like if you can encourage using that kind of thing, or we have a, this great business in town called the Center for Creative Reuse, and... So it's, it's the kind of stuff that you have lying around or people donate. And first of all, the money goes to a cool organization. But you can get, like, tons of stuff, like bags, you know, a big bag for, like, a couple bucks and just fill it up with all that kind of thing. And they're going to have all of everyone's old cast-off keys and things like that. So, you know, I think I've been experiencing, you know, people that I'll consult with at other libraries who just want to buy a kit. And, you know, they're crazily upcharge, you know, someone's just kind of put some LEDs in a conductive thread and a, some things like that in a, in a box and charged like $25 for it. <laughs> and, you know, you could put that together for a couple bucks. And, you know, so just empowering people to realize they can use whatever's lying around, you know, I think will encourage librarians to, to try that kind of thing more quickly than, you know, to think that they need to allocate. Because it's technology, it requires, you know, $25 per person per program or something like that. Yeah, Sid, it seems like you guys use reuse a lot of materials up at DreamYard, and you're kind of about, like, recycling and reuse of materials. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, sure. So we actually get a lot of donations of people's old electronics, and we tear it apart. We have this bin of just old stuff that everyone in the office has donated or someone will say like, hey, I have this old phone from 1999, do you want it? And I'm like, yeah, sure. I throw it in the bin and we have like destroy days where like the kids are just, they have a lot of energy when they come in and we're like, all right, here's the bin, here's a screwdriver, go at it. And we get a lot of our like random stuff from inside of old computers and old electronics. We also do a lot with, um, talking about artists who recycle in their work. So we t make that part of our content area where we talk about people like Willie Bester who use found objects to make art about social justice issues. So that is not just like we're making a circuit today. It's we're making a circuit, but we're also adding to a culture of someone who already does this. And we ended up, actually, we ended up hacking some of Willie Bester's artwork. One of the batteries are dead now, but... They kind of have like little stuff like this where you can put your creation inside of somebody else's thing. And we have a template on the back too where someone used it, cut out the template, stuck it on the back to put their circuit. And that was kind of the first level of that lesson, like learning about found objects, learning about artwork from people who did find objects, learning about South African apartheid. And then it was like, now that you know all this information, you learn how to make a circuit, how can you put it all together? That's so great. I love that. Um, so 
do you guys want to talk about like engineering other things like switches or anything like that or maybe how you have like the idea of establishing challenges to build up okay now you know a simple circuit where can you move it from there I'll show the soft circuits board that I was bringing over because it uses the mini lily um, Arduino which is is nice so we have a soft circuits kit we have these programming kits that we use in our the labs regular sites but we also have them in uline bins that can be shipped to every library and we use for our labs and location programs it's kind of hard to see but this panel down at the bottom let me see if I can so there's the mini lily uh, Arduino right there in the center and depending on which of the the holes the ports in the the mini lily there you sew through you'll get a different type of light so there's um, a twinkle, a blink, a heartbeat pulse, or um, a fade. So, you know, it's in that, I guess that's technically a switch. Would that be considered a switch? I think it kind of is. So you, you sew from your battery through that and then to your LEDs. So, um, you know, depending on which hole you sew through there, your LED is going to, you know, light up in a different way. So you can, you know, you could sew the shape of a heart and then have the LEDs pulse like a heart. Um, you know, it works really well for kind of fashion-related stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think that's probably the most complicated thing we've done as far as circuit making in the lab so far. But when people see, you know, not only does it light up, but it can kind of do this specific program thing without actually having to program or code, you know, that, I think kind of gets the, the wheels turning. Right, so that is pretty much the exact same, it is the exact same principle as uh, the copper tape circuits, but instead of laying down copper tape to connect positive, positive, negative, negative, you are using um, conductive thread, which you sew. Right, and it's, I forget, is it nickel or something, you know, it's some combination. Um, and you can sew, most of your piece with, with regular thread, you know, you just sew the circuit itself using the conductive thread, which is good because the conductive thread is expensive. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's more but, expensive, yeah. yeah. It has silver in it. A lot yeah. of it has, okay. it's, or it's like spun with silver. It's, and it feels weird too. It's, it's, it's really, it's a cool material to use. Um, uh, the Lily Tiny is also great, and that's something that I'd like to talk about in our next hangout for copper tape circuits. Um, I don't think I have one on me right now, but it, uh, basically, it's a very little. The AT it uses this thing that's kind of like an AT tiny. It's it looks kind of like this. I'm like grabbing different things right now, but basically, it has something like this in the center, and this is basically like a very little, very primitive computer, and you can program each leg. Basically, you can program this so that when it's connected to a certain thing like an LED or like let's say um, a light sensor or a temperature sensor or something like that it will do something so in right now the only thing that's happening is that the electrons are going through this thing and just turning the light on this is like the most simple you can get but if I were to put something like this in between the battery and the LED I could be telling this thing okay when it goes through the LED make it blink at a rate that makes it look like a heartbeat or make it blink at a rate that goes like on off on off and that's um, you use you can use um, like Arduino to do something like that I think I haven't played around with it that much this is actually my excuse to do that but basically there's ways to build up on this whether it's like doing things like building more switches or actually doing a little bit of coding here's um, one of the Really tiny, and this the little the chips right in the center there. You can see how small it is. And those things are actually pretty cheap. Also, they're about what eleven dollars each. I think less. I want to say like five, but maybe I'm wrong on SparkFun. I got they come in actually like this sheet of them. Oh. So you, and and you can usually email them and kind of work with them on like educational pricing, and they'll cut you a deal. In my experience. Yeah, so SparkFun has an educator's discount, and I think it might be about 
10 to 15 percent, maybe even more. But if you, um, I think you send them like your 501c3 paperwork and they'll work with you. And the only thing that they ask for in exchange is like some photographs or some documentation of youth using it. But they're great in terms of getting supplies. Um, I can talk a little bit about where I have gotten stuff from in the past and is not the only place to get stuff from. Or maybe you guys, like Hannah or Corey or Sid, or like you, you can share where you have sourced materials from. Well, I think we're actually going through copper tapes that we ordered when you were still in the office, so. Um, and most of our, we haven't done a lot of going into Arduinos and, and uh, programming the little computers very much. And I do want to get there. Um, so in terms of like where our material comes from, recently it's been more found object stuff. Um, yeah. We, I think we go to all the traditional sites, you know, it's like fun and Adafruit and Amazon when we need to. Um, yeah, with that kind of thing, you know, I don't know where else to sort of access them. But the great thing about SparkFund is sometimes even if you don't use it to order, that's such a great resource as far as tutorials and, and things like that, and just support as well. Uh, I generally have bought all of yeah, we the order. materials because I was working at a library in the past. Um, there were some restrictions on where we could buy stuff from, and it has to. I wasn't allowed to buy anything from places where I had to pay tax, so I was buying a lot of my stuff on Amazon. And generally, you can get a bag. And this is all on the Hangout, but I'll um, I'll post it afterwards. Um, you can get a bag of, I think, like 80 LEDs for $8 on Amazon. They ship from China, so they take a really long time to get to you. They can sometimes take a month to get to you, but it's a really great price. Um, coin cell batteries I get on Amazon. Usually you can get some sort of deal where you get 50 of them for $12, and they come in sheets like this. Um, binder clips. I work in an office. You can just grab those there. Copper tape I get from SparkFun or Adafruit. And a lot of these things you can also get at a place like Radio Shack or if you have like a Fry's Electronics near you. But I would caution you that things like coin cell batteries, if you go to the store, they tend to sell them like a dollar each. And you never want to be spending a dollar on a coin cell battery. You never want to be spending two dollars on an LED. Like I won't you know, LEDs and coin cell batteries should be at the most 15 to 17 cents each. You know, you can get them for much cheaper. So if you're trying to get as most bang for your buck, um, I would just buy them online. There's another resource called DigiKey. We can get a lot of cheap materials from, but I found that I found a lot of this. The DigiKey is impossible to navigate. Uh, so I find a lot of resources just on Amazon is where I buy things from. So basically, you could do like a copper tape circuit like something like this is going to cost you, you know, at the most 35 cents at the most. And that's like copper tape roll and all of those prices. Um, so this is why I love this um, material because it's so affordable and you don't have to be so precious with it. I think that sometimes with e-textiles, let's say you're doing a circuit, um, the battery holder, if you get one of the actual lily pad battery holders, is going to cost you like a few bucks. And then um, in the lily tiny, the the uh, the mini lily is going to cost you like six or seven dollars. So and you're sewing that into your project. So once it's sewn in, the only way you can reuse it is if you actually cut it out. With this, it can be you know you can make this, and you don't have to feel bad about throwing it away if it doesn't work. So that's why I like it as like very easy entry and I think it's also a great tool to be able to teach other people because you know you can just walk home with this and you know show your grandma or show your friends that you made something like this. We use uh, a battery pack that is from SparkFun. It's cheaper than the ones with the switches um, with like the on-off switch and you just so if you're using thread anyway there's a little hole to sew through. You can also solder through with wire um, I think it's a size 4 needle. 
fits through. It's a we, tiny needle, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a small one for sure. Um, I think it's size four, but I actually I remember that on Spark Fun. If you find that battery, I think it just comes up as like coin cell battery holder or something. Um, it's in the comments. Somebody figured out what size needle. So I think that when we were in Philly at the library and doing e-textiles, the hardest thing, and this is we should just talk about this in another conversation, the hardest thing that we didn't anticipate was just teaching kids how to sew and teaching teens how to sew. Because, you know, we weren't even thinking at that level. We were thinking, like, okay, we have to teach them about circuits and electricity first, and, like, they don't even know how to tie a knot. So just, um, so we were using a lot of big needles and then I think we ordered a bunch of those coin cell or the battery holders and then we were all just sitting there with a Dremel like making the holes bigger mm -hmm. because none of the needles could fit through because the kids didn't know how to sew. So I guess the main lesson in all of this is when you're doing this kind of thing is just to like let yourself be flexible with it if you know your your circuit might not work out right the first time but you know there's always ways to troubleshoot it and if it really is not working just throw it away and Rip the rip, take the LED, take the battery, and just try to make another circuit. And then there are also all of those um, guides that I will also post that will help you along. That will hold your hand along the process if you want. If you don't want to, um, if you don't want to do it all yourself, or if you don't want to feel like you have to invent everything on your own. Does anyone want to share what they did in the last couple of minutes that we have? I'll share something that I made. Um, so I moved to California in October, and one thing I haven't anticipated since moving here is like that my allergies would just be totally different because it's a totally different ecosystem out here than it is in Philadelphia. And so, uh, you know, for the last couple of weeks, I've just felt like I had like this really crazy flu and I couldn't focus at work. So, um, yeah, I was just walking through a cloud and finally I went to a doctor and they were like, oh, you just have really bad allergies. And the minute I started taking allergy medication, it was fine. But I was just, <laughs> I don't know why I'm sharing this. Um, <laughs> so I made this clown and, <laughs> and basically it is all of these. So I'll show you, I'll take the clown off. So here's my simple circuit. Now, if you imagine it just like this, it's just a really basic circuit, but I wanted to add a switch onto it. And so I added this little piece of paper that I taped on. And that piece of paper has a bunch of vertical pieces that will connect these two pieces. So notice there's a gap there. So right now, nothing is going to happen until I press down. And you could even like run your finger across it and then it will light up in different, a kind of like a flashing rate, supposedly. And then wherever my clown is up here, so her nose is lighting up. So that was me on Bard every day. This is me in my cubicle, <laughs> super sick. <laughs> um, yeah, but I was like, it started off with like, I just want to draw this clown. So, uh, and then I just built the circuit on top of that. <laughs> cool, so I think our next one is going to be, and we'll invite some more people on about how to take these circuits to the next level. Because as Hannah mentioned, you know, the kids got pretty sick of just doing copper tape circuits all the time. And thinking of different creative challenges or different ways to build on this basic knowledge and make it more interesting and more engaging or more challenging. Like I've heard about people giving challenges like, okay, how can you turn this into a physical object? How could you put like these copper tape circuits on like a window or a kite? Or what are different ways that you could use circuits to like illuminate spaces or make other interesting things? So that's what we'll talk about next time. Any other parting things? Yeah, Kate, you don't have to come over and show me. <laughs> I will. Give me another lesson. <laughs> And Let's also, challenged. Yeah. On, I'll post underneath the um, YouTube on our on our the YouTube page where this goes on to. I'll post a bunch of tutorials that exist and um, some other things. Cool. Have a great Memorial Day weekend, you guys. You too. Thank you.